Hello everybody, this is Jörg once again from YouTube channel Joggler66 with another reading of Babylon Mystery Religion. I'm very sorry, it has been more than a month since I uploaded part 3 and I think between all the parts it's always a month. I'm so busy with so many things that I just don't find enough time to do the readings of this wonderful book Babylon Mystery Religion which actually when you get into it, you will see it's just a compro, uh, how, how do you say that, a comprised version of um, Alexander Hislop's The Two Babylons, which I started reading in German. So I see, of course, all the resemblance. And um, I'm looking forward to do the reading now of Chapter 4 today of Babylon Mystery Religion, which is called Saints, Saints Days and Sun Worship Symbols. Well, <laughs> Saints days, huh? that is very fitting for the time that we are living in right now with Christmas around at the end of 2015 because today is the 21st of December when I'm uh, reading this in I don't know when I will upload the video but that will be a few days later I guess okay without any further ado here it comes Saints, Saints days and sun worship, worship symbols in addition to the prayers and devotions that are directed to Mary, Roman Catholics also honor and pray to various saints, martyrs or other notable people of the Church who have died. In many minds, the word saint refers to a person who has attained some special degree of holiness, only a very unique follower of Christ. But according to the Bible, all true Christians are saints. Thank you. Ralph Woodrow for pointing that out because I was eager to make the point the difference between saints in the Roman Catholic Church who are all dead and saints of the Bible who are all living because God is a God of the living and not a God of the dead. Anyway, according to the Bible, as the author says, all true Christians are saints, even those who may sadly lack spiritual maturity or knowledge. Thus, the writings of Paul to Corinthians at Ephesus, Philippi, Corinth or Rome were addressed to the saints, as we can read in Ephesians 1 verse 1 and following. So I'm going to read Ephesians chapter 1 verses 1 through 4 for you to give you the um, quote where this comes from. Quote, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. End quote. Very important when you read in verse 4, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. It is all predestined. God has written our name in the book of life before the foundation of the world. You have to understand that and then try to grasp the magnitude of what that actually says. Okay, the author continues. Saints, it should be noticed, were living people, not those who had died, as I made the point orally. Spiritually speaking, if we desire <coughs> sorry, if we desire the prayers of the saints, we should contact living people. But if we try to commune with people that have died, what else is this but a form of spiritism? Repeatedly the Bible condemns all attempts to commune with the dead. See Isaiah 8 verses 19 and 20. Quote, and when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not the people seek unto their God, for the living to the dead? To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. End quote. Yet many recite the Apostles' Creed, which says, We believe 
in the communion of saints, supposing that such includes the idea of prayers for and to the dead. Concerning this very point, the Catholic Encyclopedia says, quote, Catholic teaching regarding prayers for the dead is bound up inseparably with the doctrine of the communion of saints, which is an article of the Apostles' Creed, unquote. Prayers, quote, to the saints and martyrs collectively, or to some uh, or to someone of them in particular, unquote, are recommended. The actual wording of the Council of Trent is that, quote, the saints who reign together with Christ offer up their own prayers to God for men. It is good and useful suppliantly to invoke them and to have recourse to their prayers, aid and help for obtaining benefits from God. Unquote. What are the objections to those beliefs? We will let the Catholic Encyclopedia answer for itself. Quote, the chief objections raised against the intercession and invocation of the saints are that these doctrines are opposed to the faith and trust which we should have in God alone, and that they cannot be proved from scriptures. Unquote. <laughs> they cannot be proved by scriptures. No, nothing the Roman Catholic Church does can be proved by scriptures because it's antichrist. With this statement, we agree. Nowhere do the scriptures indicate that the living can be blessed or benefited by prayers to or through those who have already died. Instead, in many ways, the Catholic doctrines regarding saints are very similar, uh, similar to the old SUN sun worship ideas that were held regarding the gods. Looking back to the mother of false religion, Babylon that is, we find that the people prayed to and honored a plurality of gods. In fact, the Babylonian system developed until it had some 5,000 gods and goddesses. In much the same way as Catholics believe concerning their saints, the Babylonians believed that their gods had at one time been living heroes on earth, but were now on a higher plane. Every month and every day of the month was under the protection of a particular divinity. There was a god for this problem, a god for each of the different occupations, a god for this and a god for that. So, I'm going to go into a little note here. Now, with all these different gods, it's very interesting. I did a little research uh, on the internet and um, I found a list of so-called major Roman gods and a list, of, a list of minor Roman gods. I'm not going to read them all to you. It's uh, a very interesting website and I will put the link in the description box of the video here. I just want to read to you a little bit from the web page from uh, the, min uh, the, the major Roman gods a little bit. Like we have, for example, Apollo. And that is in the origin also in Greek, Apollo. Eh? We're speaking about Roman gods. So the Roman god Apollo has also an origin in Greek, which also is called Apollo. It's the son of Jupiter and Leto, the twin brother of Diana. He is the god of music, playing a golden lyre. The archer, far shooting with a uh, silver bow. The god of healing, who taught man medicine. The god of light, the god of truth, who cannot speak a lie. One of Apollo's more important daily tasks is to harness his chariot with four horses and drive, uh, and drive the sun across the sky. He is famous for his oracle at Delphi. People traveled to it from all over the Greek world to divine the future. He was the laurel, the crowd his bird, the dolphin his animal. When we come to the Roman god Ceres, we have the Greek Demeter, corn goddess, eternal mother, the sorrowing mother, grain mother, goddess of agriculture, grain, crops, initiation, civilization, lawgiver, uh, and the love a mother, a mother bears for her child, protectress of woman, motherhood, marriage, daughter of Saturn and Ops. She and her daughter Proserpine 
were the counterparts of the Greek goddesses Demeter and Persephone. Her worship involved fertility rites and rites for the dead, and her chief festival was the Cerealia. Now there's just one little remark that I want to give on Ceres, which in Greek was called Demeter. I don't know if you guys over there in the United States of America are familiar with that, but here in Europe we have a company that is called Demeter, which is an uh, organic farming company and uh, having very high... Um, uh, is, 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 is very high regarded uh, with the people who are talking about uh, organic farming because they have very high standards. And I always knew, yeah, it came from these uh, from these gods. So, you know, I like organic farming and everything, but why do they have to link that? Why do they have to link organic farming to pagan gods and goddesses? I don't know. And then the list goes on. I'm not going to read it all to you, but just to give you a little idea. And I put the link in the description box so you can read it for yourself. The Roman god Ceres is Demeter in Greek. The Roman god of goddess Diana is Artemis in Greek. Juno in Rome is Hera in Greek. Jupiter in Rome is Zeus in Greek. Mars is Iris in Greek. Mercury is Hermes. Minerva is Athena, and even in the Etruscan, Menra, Menra. Neptune is in Greek, Poseidon. Venus is in Greek, Aphrodite. Vesta is Hestia, and Vulcan in Roman is Hephaestus, Hephaestus in Greek. So you see that when the Greek civilization went down, all the gods in the Roman Empire then, just got another name. If there were still the same de de deities um, and probably also associated with the same things before, but actually, and that's the point, uh, one civilization went down, the next civilization picked up and they just took the same gods over. That's the same that happened when Babylon went down and the Medo-Persians took over and then when Medo-Persia went down and Greek took over, and now we are talking about what happened when Greek went down and Roman took over. And what's the next step? And that is something that you really have to understand. The next step was when Rome, so-called, went down, fell into pieces, it took the garments of Christianity. And it took all the saints of Christianity. So the same gods are still living on today in the form of so-called Christian saints and they are actually nothing else than the quote-unquote gods of the Romans they had before. That's why Christianity today, what is called Christianity today, Roman Catholicism, is so pagan is so evil it has nothing to do with the god of the bible it has everything to do with pagan gods who are more in the world because of the worship of the creation instead of the worship of the creator but like i said already twice i will put the links in the box and then you can have a look for yourself and study a little bit for yourself on this but the author continues even the Buddhists in China had their, quote, worship of various deities, as the goddess of sailors, the god of war, the gods of special neighborhoods or occupations, unquote. The Syrians believed the, power of, uh, believed the powers of certain gods were limited to certain areas, as an incident in the Bible records. And we can read that in 1 Kings 20, verse 23, quote, And the servants of the king of Syria said unto him, Their gods are gods of the hills. Therefore, they are stronger than we, but let us fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. Unquote. When Rome conquered the world, these same ideas were very much in evidence, as the following sketch will show. Brigitte was goddess of smiths and poetry. Juno Regina was the goddess of womanhood and marriage. Minerva was the goddess of wisdom, handicrafts and musicians. Venus was the goddess of sexual love and birth. Vesta was the goddess of bakers and sacred fires. Ops was the goddess of wealth. 
Ceres was the goddess of corn, wheat, and growing vegetation. Remember, Ceres, Demeter. Our word cereal, fittingly, comes from her name, from the goddess Ceres. Hercules and the god, uh, was the god of joy and wine. Mercury was the god of orators and, in the old fables, quite an orator himself, which explains why the people of Lystra thought of Paul as the god of Mercury, as we can read in, read in Acts 14, verses 11 and 12. Quote, and when the people saw that Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Ly uh, Lycaonia, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius, because he was the chief speaker. Unquote. The gods Castor and Pollux were the protectors of Rome and the travelers at sea, as we can read in Acts 28, verse 11. Quote, and after three months we departed in the ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the isle, whose sign was Castor and Pollux. End quote. Cronus was the guardian of oaths. Janus was the god of doors and gates. Quote, there were gods who presided over every moment of a man's life, gods of house and garden, of food and drink, of health and sickness. Unquote. With the idea of gods and goddesses associating with various events in life now established in SUN worshipping Rome, it was but another step for these same concepts to finally be merged into the Church of Rome. Since converts from SUN sun worship were reluctant to part with their gods, unless they could find some satisfactory counterpart in Christianity, the gods and goddesses were renamed and called saints. The point I made a minute a few ago. Huh? The old idea of gods associated with certain occupations and days has continued in the Roman Catholic belief in saints and saints' days, as the following table shows. Now we'll put the table into the video that you can see it for yourself. I'm not going to read all that, but it reads that you have, for example, a god for actors, which are a saint for actors, let's call it, a saint for actors, called Saint Genesius. And his day is August 25th. And you have one for architects, Saint Thomas, on December 21st, and so on and so on. For athletes, bakers, beggars, booksellers, bricklayers, builders, butchers, cab drivers, candle makers, comedians, cooks, dentists, doctors, editors, fishermen, florists, hatmakers, housekeepers, hunters, laborers, lawyers, librarians, merchants, miners, musicians, notaries, nurses, painters, pharmacists, plasterers, paint, uh, printers, sailors, scientists, singers, steelworkers, students, surgeons and tailors. Just for students, I want to mention, they chose St. Thomas Aquilin, Aqu uh, Aquilinas, March 7th. I don't know if this is a miswriting uh, of the name. Uh, maybe it's Thomas Aquinas. I have to check that maybe on the internet. But it would be fitting, because Thomas Aquinas, the doctor of the Roman Catholic Church, lived in the 13th century, whose feast day then is March 7th, that would be very fitting to call that one for uh, for students. But it said here, St. Thomas Aquilian, Aqu Aquilinus, not Aquinas, so I'm not sure about that. But that would be very fitting. So you see, for every of those uh, professions, they have their own saint. Now, everything considered, it seems evident that the Roman Catholic system of patron saints developed out of the earlier beliefs in gods devoted to days, occupations and the various needs of human life. But why pray to saints when Christians have access to God? Please, you Catholics, explain that to me when you can have a personal relationship with your God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why are you praying to dead saints? Why pray to saints when Christians have access to God? Catholics are taught 
that through praying to saints they may be able to obtain help that God otherwise might not give. They are told to worship God and St. Hubert, patron of hunters, then to, quote, pray first too with St. Elizabeth, St. Mary and the holy apostles and the holy martyrs and all God's saints to consider them as friends and protectors and to implore their aid in the hour of distress with the hope that God would grant to the patron what he might otherwise refuse to the supplicant, unquote. Why would God refuse a question, a request, a prayer request from an honest supplicant, from an honest Bible-believing Christian? He wouldn't. But the problem is, most people today are not honest Bible-believing Christians. They are believing in what other people tell them, what the people from the pulpits preach to them. And that is not biblical, that is not scriptural, that's the point. So you are taught to pray in a different way to satisfy the teachings of man instead of return to the teachings of God. Now St. Hubert was born about 656 and appeared on our list as the patron saint of hunters and healer of hydrophobia. Before his conversion, almost all of his time was spent hunting. On a good Friday morning, according to legend, he pursued a large stag which suddenly turned and he saw a crucifix between its antlers and heard a voice telling him to turn to God. He is now designated as the patron saint of hunters and healer of hydrophobia. Yeah, you know, when you have a vision like that, check the spirit. Doesn't the Bible say that? That you always have to check the spirit that comes into you if it is biblical? I seriously doubt that St. Hubert saw a biblical spirit there. Now the author continues, many of the old legends that had been associated with the SUN sun worship gods were transferred over to the saints. The Catholic Encyclopedia even says these, quote, Legends repeat the conceptions found in the pre-Christian religious tales. The legend is not Christian. It is only Christianized. In many cases it has ab obviously the same origin as the myth. Antiquity traced back sources whose natural elements it did not understand to the heroes. Such was also the case with many legends of the saints. It became easy to transfer to the Christian martyrs the conceptions which the ancients held concerning their heroes. This transference was promoted by the numerous cases in which Christian saints became the successors of local deities, and Christian worship supplanted the ancient local worship. This explains the great number of similarities between gods and saints. Unquote from the Catholic Encyclopedia. The Catholic Encyclopedia tells you exactly how this saint worship is non-scriptural. So why would you follow it when you know that only the Bible is the basis of your authority. Why would you do that when you know that only God can be the leader of your conscience and God is not to be found in the teachings and traditions of men like in the Roman Catholic Church? I don't get it. Just get out a Bible and read for yourself. You don't even need to read books like this when you have the Bible, when you understand the Bible. You don't need people to tell you that everything else in the Bible is wrong. You only have to understand that everything but the Bible is wrong. Get to the Bible. And not praying to dead saints and ancient pagan gods. There's one God. And there's one mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus. Pray to him when you pray to your father. 
pray to Jesus when you pray to your Father. Pray to the Father through Jesus and not through Mary or some man-made saint, whatever they teach you. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life and nobody comes to the Father except through me. So, when you believe the Bible, when you believe in Jesus Christ, then follow Jesus Christ and do as he says, not as man says. Okay, on the bottom of page 28, the author continues, As SUN, sun worship and Christianity were mixed together, sometimes a saint was given a similar sounding name as that of the SUN sun worship god or goddess it replaced. The goddess Victoria of the Best Alps was renamed as Saint Victoire, Charon as Saint Cyrenos, Artemis as Saint Artemidos, Dionysus as Saint Dionysus, etc. The goddess Birgit, regarded as the daughter of the sun god, S-U-N, sun god, and who was represented with a child in her arms, was smoothly renamed as Saint Bridget. In S-U-N sun worship days, her chief temple at Kildare was served by Vestal virgins, who tended the sacred fires. Later her temple became a convent, and her Vestals became nuns. They continued to tend the ritual fire, only it was now called St. Bridges Fire. The best preserved ancient temple now remaining in Rome is the Pantheon, which in olden times was dedicated, according to the inscription over the portico, to, quote, Jove and all the gods, unquote. This was reconsecrated by Pope Boniface IV to, quote, the Virgin Mary and all the saints, unquote. Such practices were not uncommon. Quote, churches or ruins of churches have been frequently found on the sites where SUN sun worship shrines or temples originally stood. It is also to some extent true that sometimes the saint whose aid was to be invoked at the Christian shrine be, uh, bore some outward analogy to the deity previously hallowed in that place. Thus, in Athens, the shrine of the healer Asclepius, when it became a church, was made sacred to the two saints whom the Christian Athenians invoked as miraculous healers, Cosmas and Damian. Unquote. A cave shown in Bethlehem as the place in which Jesus was born was, according to Jerome, actually a rock shrine in which the Babylonian god Tammuz had been worshipped. The scriptures never state Jesus was born in a cave. Throughout the Roman Empire, SUN sun worship died in one form, only to live again with the Roman Catholic Church. Did you get it? Did you pay attention? Here it comes again. Throughout the Roman Empire, sun worship died in one form, only to live again within the Roman Catholic Church. Not only did the devotion to the old gods continue in a new form, but the use of statues of these gods as well. In some cases, it is said, the very same statues that had been worshipped as sun worship gods were renamed as Christian saints. Now, best example that I can give you of that is the statue of St. Peter. When you go to the Vatican, you go to St. Peter's Basilica, there's a statue of St. Peter that was actually taken from the Pantheon where it was called Jupiter. That's what I meant when I tell, when I tell you that the pagan Roman Empire baptized itself with the garments of Christianity. That's just one of the examples. I think a very strong example, you know, about the statue of St. Peter. And, hey, don't believe me? Check it out for yourselves. Check it out for yourselves. 
I dare you. Through the centuries, the author continues, more and more statues were made, until today there are churches in Europe which contain as many as two, three and four thousand statues. In large, impressive cathedrals, in small chapels, at wayside shrines, on the dashboards of automobiles, in all these places the idols of Catholicism may be found in abundance. I said that in uh, in a few videos before, I think, already. Over here in Belgium, where I am, you found on nearly every street corner a little chapel. I mean, not every ch street corner, but you know what I mean. You know, I'm not exaggerating, but very frequently you find these little chapels. And sometimes you, you even have to look for them because they are so built in the cave that you, you, you look over them. It's just crazy. And people are devoting themselves to go there every day and to put new candles in there to see that their Virgin Mary exposed in these little chapels will always have a light, you know. And you know where the candles come from, right? The candles is just the souls for the dead, huh? Okay, the author continues on the bottom of page 29. The use of such idols within the Roman Catholic Church provides another clue in solving the mystery of modern Babylon. For, as Herodotus mentioned, Babylon was the source from which all systems of idolatry flowed to the nations. To link the word idols with statues of Mary and the saints may sound quite harsh to some. But can this be totally incorrect? It is admitted in Catholic writings that at numerous times and among various people, images of the saints have been worshipped in superstitious ways. Such abuses, however, are generally placed in the past. It is explained that in this enlightened age no educated person actually worships the object itself, but rather what the object represents. Generally, this is true. But is this not also true of heathen tribes that use idols, unmistakably idols, in the worship of demon gods? Most of these do not believe the idol itself is a god, but only representative of the demon god they actually worship. Several articles within the Catholic Encyclopedia seek to explain that the use of images is proper on the basis of them being representative of Christ or the saints. Quote, the honor which is given to them is referred to the objects which they represent, so that through the images which we kiss and before which we uncover our heads and kneel, we adore Christ and venerate the saints whose likeness they are. Unquote. Not all Christians are convinced, however, that this explanation is strong enough reason to bypass verses such as in Exodus 20 verse 4 and 5 and I'm going to read to you Exodus 20 4 5 and 6 listen carefully especially if you're a Catholic and you have only been taught the Ten Commandments from the Catechism listen Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them for I the Lord thy God am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me, and keep my commandments." Unquote. Could God be any clearer than this? Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them. So whenever you go to a statue of Mary, St. Peter, or whatever, and you kneel down for that, you are blaspheming God. That's what it comes down to. And you break 
his commandment, which is very, very clear. How much clearer can you be? Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. Isn't that clear? In the Old Testament, when the Israelites conquered a heathen city or country, they were not to adopt the idols of these people into their religion. Such were to be destroyed, even though they might be covered with silver and gold. And we can read in Deuteronomy 7, verse 25, quote, The graven images of their gods shall ye burn with fire. Thou shalt not desire the silver or gold that is on them, nor take it unto thee, lest thou be snared therein. For it is an abomination to the Lord thy God. Unquote. They were to destroy all their pictures of S.U.N. sun worship, Guards also, as in Numbers 33.52 we can read, quote, Then ye shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you, and destroy all their pictures, and destroy all their molten images, and quite pluck down all their high places. Unquote. To what extent these instructions were to be carried out under the New Testament has been often debated over the centuries. Well, that is just the problem. <coughs> Excuse me. That's just the problem that we have with modern day Christianity. The laws of the Ten Commandments are still existent and never, never ever will cease to exist. So as a true Bible believing Christian, you know that in cases like this, there is no, nor ever has there been, any change. And you want confirmation to that? Repeat, to what extent these instructions were to be carried out under New Testament has often been debated over the centuries. I give you confirmation of that, that as a true Bible-believing Christian you know that in cases like this there is no, nor ever will has been or will be any change. For confirmation read Matthew 24.35 Mark 13, verse 31, and Luke 21, verse 33. All three quotes, word for word, Jesus says the same words. Quote, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Unquote. The Catholic Encyclopedia gives a historical sketch of this, showing how people fought and even died over this very issue, especially in the 8th century. Though upholding the use of statues and pictures, it says, quote, There seems to have been a dislike of holy pictures, a suspicion that their use was, or might become, idolatrous among certain Christians for many centuries, unquote, and mentions several Catholic bishops who were of the same opinion. For people to fight and kill each other over this issue, regardless of which side they were on, was unmistakably contrary to the teachings of Christ. For people to fight and kill each other over this issue was unmistakably contrary to the teachings of Christ. What does Christ teach? Thou shalt not kill. The sun worshippers placed a circle or aureole around the heads of those who were quote unquote gods in their pictures. This practice continued right on in the heart of the Romish Church. The above picture, the one of Saint Augustine that I'm going to show you in the video right now, is the way St. Augustine is shown in Catholic books, with a circular disc around his head. This circular disc, people, is just the sun. That's why it is called S-U-N, sun worship, because these people always have this aureole around their head, which is the sun symbol of sun worship. Worshipping the creation more than the creator. 
all Catholic saints are pictured this same way. But to see that this practice was borrowed from heathenism, we need only to notice the drawing of Buddha, which also features the circular symbol around his head. The artists and sculptors of ancient Babylon used the disc or aureola around any being they wished to represent as a god or goddess. The Romans depicted Circe, the S.U.N. sun worship goddess of the sun, with a circle surrounding, surrounding her head. From its use in S.U.N. sun worshipping Rome, the same symbolism passed into papal Rome and has continued to this day as evidenced in thousands of paintings of Mary and the saints. Pictures, supposedly of Christ, were painted with quote-unquote golden beams surrounding his head. This was exactly the way the S.U.N. God of S.U.N. sun worshippers had been represented for centuries. Drawings of Catholic saints are commonly pictured with a circle or aureole around their heads. So did the artists and sculptures of ancient Babylon around the heads of any being they wished to represent as a god or goddess. The Romans depicted Circe, the goddess of the sun, with a circle surrounding her head. While not a major point in itself, a comparison of the pictures of Circe Buddha and St. Augustine, each with a circular symbol around their heads, shows that this usage was influenced by pre-Christian custom. Now, this shows that this usage of the aureole around the head was influenced by pre Christian custom. What's another word for custom? That what the Roman Catholic Church is built upon. Tradition. Pre-Christian tradition. And the people held on to their traditions instead to the word of God. Isn't that what Jesus told the Pharisees? You uphold more the traditions than the word of God. Didn't he say that? I think so. The church of the first four centuries used no pictures of Christ. They used no pictures of Christ. The scriptures do not give us any description of the physical features of Jesus whereby an accurate painting could be made of him. It seems evident then that the pictures of Christ, like those of Mary and the saints, have come from the imaginations of artists. Imaginations! What's another word for imaginations? For Catholics and for evangelicals? Spiritual exercises. The teaching of Ignatius Loyola. The teaching of the Jesuits to get closer to God. Have imaginations. Have spiritual exercises. Have spiritual experiences. Yeah, all these come from other spirits, bad spirits, evil spirits, not Bible spirits, not the spirit of the Spirit of God. We only have to make a short study of religious art to find that in different centuries and among different nationalities, many pictures of Christ, some very different, may be found. Obviously all of these cannot be what he looked like. Besides, having now ascended into heaven, we no longer know him quote unquote after the flesh, as we can read in Second Corinthians chapter five, verse sixteen. Quote, Wherefore henceforth now we know we know man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Having been glorified, as we can read in John 7, verse 39, quote, But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, 
because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Unquote. And with a glorious body, as we can read in uh, Philippians 3, verses 20 and 21. Quote, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look to the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Unquote. Not even the best artist in the world could portray the king in his beauty. Any picture, even at its best, could never show how wonderful he really is. Amen. Now, without the four quotes, I'm going to read this last few sentences again to finish this um, chapter of the book. We only have to make a short study of religious art to find that in different centuries and among different nationalities, many pictures of Christ, some very different, may be found. Obviously, all of these cannot be what he looked like. Besides, Having now ascended into heaven, we no longer know him after the flesh. Having been glorified and with a glorious body, not even the best artist in the world could portray the king in his beauty. Any picture, even at its best, could never show how wonderful he really is. Praise the Lord. That's the way it is. What a wonderful way to conclude chapter 4 of Babylon Mystery Religion. I hope you enjoyed it. Study a little bit the links I provide in the description box of the video. Do your own study and first and for all read the Bible. The 1611 authorized version of the King James Bible. The only true preserved Word of God in our days today. Read it. Study it. Love it. Pray to God through Jesus Christ, that's the way it is intended. Stay away from idols, stay away from pictures. You know, when I think about it, never ever have I used a picture of Jesus Christ in one of my videos. I think there's one about the baptism. Because it was supposed to show the baptism of Jesus Christ in the River Jordan. Yeah, uh, that one I used. But there are so many videos when you watch Christian videos that show so-called Jesus Christ, whether on the cross or here and there. I never did that because I don't think that I can even imagine how wonderful the glory that surrounds him is and what he looks like. I don't think that in this carnal world I can imagine or even make a picture that in the forest wouldn't even resemble him. So don't do it. And I surely will not do any spiritual exercises on that. When it is time and he calls me, I will see my father and I will see my king. And that's the time when I will see and I don't need to use any imagination and I surely don't need to use any idol or picture or whatever from here down on earth. And so shouldn't you. But you should understand where this idol worship comes from. From all these old pagan Babylonian, Etruscan, Greek and Roman gods that were just baptizing the Roman Empire with Christianity. And by that Christianity was hijacked. And that is why the Roman Catholics call, them, call themselves today Christians. Because they think they are. But they are not. They have another spirit. And I'm not talking about the lay people in the Roman Catholic Church. I love them. But they are deceived. Because they follow the magisterium of the Roman Catholic Church. Because they don't think for themselves. And those other people I want to wake up with reading these videos and remind them, remind them in my 
in the best of my heart that I can do, of Revelation 18, verse 4. Remember that? And I heard another voice from heaven, saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to her works. In the cup which she hath filled, fill her to double. Come out of her, my people, come out of the Roman Catholic Church, come out of any apostate Protestant Church, come out of any so-called Church. Find your own Church, as Jesus said, Wherever two or three of you are gathered together in the Spirit, in their midst I will be. That is true Ecclesia. That is true Church. That is true Fellowship. And everything else is of the devil. Everything else is of the devil, with Babylonian roots, which I hope I showed you a little bit more today in this reading. Of Babylon Mystery Religion, Chapter 4. Okay, looking forward to reading Chapter 5 another day. Until then, leave some comments whenever you feel like it and discuss the book a little bit with me. I'm only sitting here alone and it's nice to have here and there some feedback. Anyway, I wish you further a nice day and God bless you all. Until the next time. Bye-bye.